Well, good morning, Bethany North. It's so good to be together today on this Palm Sunday as we begin Holy Week together. Uh, will you join us in singing as we worship God uh, this morning? You made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Your promises remain. You give justice to the weak. You care for the widow and orphan. Forever, Lord, you reign. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. whose confidence is Him alone. You make the blinded eyes to see and cherish those who seek your face. Your faithful love in This morning, my name is Anna Guerrero, and I'm director of family ministry. I just have a few things for community highlights. Today is Palm Sunday, and this is one of my favorite Sundays of the entire year. And so many of my memories are wrapped around our kids greeting you with palms and walking through the through the sanctuary with palms in this praise. So today. Join me from one to three and a whole host of people excited to bring this Palm Sunday experience to you in a drive-through event at Shorewood High School, one to 3 p.m. at Shorewood. I can't wait to see you there. And 
coming this next weekend is Holy Weekend. This is all Holy Week. And then coming up, we have a Good Friday service. This is gonna be so special. It's online, 7.30 p.m. You're not gonna wanna miss it. It's a beautiful, beautiful service. We're really excited about it. And then Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, we're gonna have two different opportunities to experience worship. There's a primary way where you could experience it online, our typical times, 8, 9, 30, and 11. And it is going to be beautiful, a wonderful time of worshiping God. And then there's a secondary way. We are going to have a really awesome and low-key worship service at Shorewood High School. That's at 10 a.m. on Sunday Easter at Shorewood High School. And you have to register beforehand because there's going to be lots of details about keeping our our in-person service safe as well as any details about how to get into the space and all those things. So registration closes today, 5 p.m. It's Palm Sunday, and the registration for Easter closes today at 5 p.m. So make sure you register to join us for Easter if that's what you're looking to do. I'm going to pray for our worship our worship service to continue here and thank God for the gifts that uh, you've been so generously supporting here with Bethany North that God would bless this time. Lord, thanks so much for how you continue to provide in just amazing and miraculous ways. Thank you for the worship that is happening in our homes at this time and how we're able to be together and uh, worshiping you and lifting up your name. Thank you for this beautiful Sunday, this Palm Sunday, where you declare yourself king as you walk in to Jerusalem. And what a beautiful, beautiful week that that brings out. Lord, we pray um, a special blessing over the ways that uh, people are giving today, whether online or uh, through the app or sending in checks. Thank you, Lord, for your provision here. In Jesus' name, amen.
and you are so faithful and you will see us through you will see us through Lord Jesus God I pray over every home I pray over everyone that is watching this video on Sunday morning Jesus I pray you fill their homes God with your Holy Spirit with your presence God shift the atmosphere Lord Jesus make it different make it new all these things in your name, God. Amen. Good morning. My name is Vanessa Fenlison, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm excited because we're going to talk about a celebration, a party. And you know what? I love parties. We're going to talk about a party that happened a long time ago. 2,000 years ago, the sun rises on a small village. The air is still cool. The annoying flies are not awake yet. And there in front of the village, there's a big tree. And under the tree, there's a father and his son. In front of them, they have already put a lot of stuff. A little jar of oil, another jar filled with water, some flour, salt, figs, dates, a few nuts, spices, all these goods are ready to be sold. And they know today is a special day. Actually, all week is a special week where they're going to be able to sell a little bit more because people are coming from all over the country to go to the big city of Jerusalem. It's like a big vacation. Everybody stops everything they're doing. And every year, they take a week to go to the temple to remember the Passover and to worship God. 
Suddenly, two men are approaching. They're stopping, looking at the display. Move on, they don't want to buy anything, but the little boy can see something strange. They're, they're untying their colt. So the little boy wants to scream and say, hey, stop, thief! But his dad is faster. He grabs the man's arm and he just says, you're not allowed to take my, my donkey. This is, this is mine. The two men are very calm and just explain that their master needs it. And they will bring it back. To the little boy's surprise, his dad lets these two men take the donkey, their only animal. So he wants to argue with his dad, but his dad just explains that he's not really sure why he did that, but he feels right. And he feels so good about it. They don't have time to talk more about it because more people are coming and they want to buy and they have to serve them. Oh, the sun is high in the sky now and it's hot and the boy is tired. He wants to sit down, but there he can hear some noises. Is that music? So he just shades his eyes from the sun to look a little further and way back there in the distance he can see a big cloud of sand. That's not a few people, that's a crowd. So he stops and he looks and he pays attention and as the crowd is approaching, he can see there in front of everybody their, their little colt with a man sitting on it. And people are dancing, people are singing. There's kind of this song going and going over and over, saying Hosanna, Hosanna. The little boy's heart is starting to be really hard. He's excited, he's not sure why, but it's a party, it's a celebration. And without thinking, he and his dad leave all their goods and go towards the crowd. They go, they try and push through, his dad goes ahead, and the boy sees his father take his coat off his shoulder. His coat is his protection against the sun and the sand and the cold at night. It's the only garment he has. Of course he has a tunic, but he has this garment on top. That's what he has. And he takes it and he puts it on the ground and his son wants to say, Dad, no, but he doesn't. He watches the little donkey step on it. It's like a red carpet. So the boy wants to do something too. He looks around, he climbs on a tree, he cuts a few branches, he gives them to the other kids and together they wave their branch and they wave and they sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed he is the man who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, we have a savior. Now, you know, this story is really important and we celebrate it every year. And I'm sure you remember being at church and waving this branch, not really knowing why, but I'm going to tell you why. You know, Jesus walked on that, I mean, he didn't walk on the donkey, he was sitting on the donkey. But he walked in Jerusalem in front of everybody and for the first time he said, I am your king, I am your savior. Come and see what I'm going to do because I love you so much. And this is what you'll discover next week. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for that beautiful, beautiful story. I have the scripture today is in Exodus 32. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods. Who will go before us? For this fellow, Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Fashioning it with a tool, they said, these are, are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and 
presented fellowship offerings toward afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry then the lord said to moses go down because your people whom you brought out of egypt have become corrupt and matthew Twenty one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Whom Jesus, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the pro- prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church. Uh, good to be with you. I'm going to just say a prayer and we'll jump right in. Lord God, thank you so much for this morning, this Palm Sunday. Thank you for this community, which uh, is going through a year of being a virtual church. We're grateful, God, for the chance, for any chance to hear from your word. We pray your spirit would break through homes and TVs and computers and laptops and iPads and phones that people would hear you with fresh ears. God, we know that you have a message for your people today. So speak. We want to listen. In your great name we pray. Amen. So it's Palm Sunday, uh, 2021. Our title of our message today is called Failure and Future Glory. Failure and Future Glory. And and really this question as we get started, how can failure become a predictor of future blessing in the scriptures? How does failure become a predictor of future blessing? As I was thinking about this message today, I I was just thinking, man, this is complicated. Uh, To combine Palm Sunday and this message of... of, uh, Moses and the golden calf, and how did these things combine? I mean, Moses, 1,500 years before Jesus, he sacrificed everything to lead his people out of slavery, and in the story today, he goes up to be with God, and the people make an idol. The Israelites, they've talked to Aaron, the brother-in-law to Moses, into after 40 days, they're like, we don't even remember that man. Let's, let's make a golden calf. Let's, let's worship him, and the results are disastrous. And then as you just heard Anna read in the New Testament reading from Matthew 21, Palm Sunday, we read about people who lay coats and palm branches onto the road heading into Jerusalem saying, Hosanna, here comes the king to set us free from our slavery to Rome. They would end up being the final week of Jesus' earthly life, put to death five days later. The results are also disastrous. What do these two events, 1,500 years apart from each other, teach us about the heart of God? And more importantly, about the heart of humanity. Now, I need to be honest with you, church. These are they're tough texts. I mean, in Exodus, the disobedience end up costing people their lives. There's bloodshed. And Moses asks people to repent, and the people that don't repent and return, it costs them their lives. And in the same way, in Matthew 21, Jesus is on a donkey and he's worshiped for a movement completely ulterior to his actual mission statement, where five days later, the same crowd saying Hosanna would say, crucify. I've heard it explained to me that that text in Exodus is like a surgery that when something's malignant or sick, we have to go in and cut it out to explain why bloodshed happens in the Old Testament. But that's not an easy story to consume. Like you, I like easy stories. But in today's text, the reminder is we prepare for Good Friday and Easter. Before we get to Easter, we must see the pain and bloodshed of Good Friday. And I know there's a lot of atonement theories out there, exactly what Jesus was accomplishing on the cross. But the simple fact remains, there was a cross. And Jesus gave himself up and was put to death on a Roman death instrument on our behalf. And we'll lament and mourn on Friday night. And we will praise and worship on Sunday morning. But today, I want us to look at three specific things. 
I want to see us, I'm going to teach that we need to remember because Palm Sunday is a holiday of missed religious expectations and I want us to confess because God's followers have often got the character of wrong God in the past, got it wrong, but I want us to hunger and ask to see more of God's glory in our lives. So let's start here at this first point. Remember that Palm Sunday is really a holiday of misplaced religious expectations. I mean, beyond the palms and and all the excitement, like the reality is that uh, when we think about Palm Sunday, we have to remember that people were worshiping a way in which Jesus ultimately would not fulfill. In that regard, Palm Sunday is a holiday of misplaced human expectation. If you think about it for a minute, like if you think about the secular holidays in our society, if Easter bunnies were supposed to deliver candy and never did, or if Santa never brought presents, or if Valentine's Day there was never hearts, never chocolates, if Mother's Day was not a day of remembering motherhood or women in your life, if Father's Day was just a bust and no one remembered, which is kind of sometimes how Father's Day is, you know, but hey, if these were holidays that were not practiced, they would probably disappear from our calendar. But the fact of the matter is Palm Sunday remains. It remains on our calendar because we need to be aware. We have often, as, as, a, as Christians, we've had wrong expectations of God. And oftentimes our worship might be tied to our comfort or our idea of God's timing. See, Palm Sunday is a declaration that for the people of God then, they got it wrong. And today, we need to understand, we need to have caution that God's ways are not our ways. And so Palm Sunday is a declaration that the king came for his kingdom, not mine. He didn't care about their expectations. Still, Jesus came riding in on the colt, even though they didn't quite know what he was coming for. So I'd never thought about this connection before between Palm Sunday and Mount Sinai and the Israel people with the golden calf. But those 1,500 years between Palm Sunday and Exodus 32, we have, to, we have to remember. For the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, they were slaves and, and, and God had brought them through. There was the Passover. They walked through the Red Sea. There was the gift of water and manna and quail and God's presence like no other community before in the history of humanity. Remember Exodus 13, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And at night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God was so present. They had seen God do amazing things. And then in Exodus 32, the text we just heard read, they asked for a golden calf while Moses was literally on the mountain with God getting the Ten Commandments. What in the world is going on here? Well, Moses was gone a long time, Scott. I mean, it was 40 days. Like, let me read Exodus 32. When the people saw Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, hmm, We don't know him. I mean, come on. 40 days, they go from like faithful followers trying to like follow Moses to calf worshipers. It's amazing what can happen when we have to wait for God to deliver, right? If I can teach for a minute, minute, just hear this. God doesn't work on your timelines or mine. He never has. See, God has taken his people into the desert to prepare them for the promised land, but the Israelites feel like it's taking too long. And the followers of God have often misplaced expectations on God, his timing, his actions, his gifts. Am I talking to anyone out there? I know I'm talking to myself. We, tr- we tie trust to God's delivering certain things in certain times by our desires. And the reality here for us as New Testament Christians, we need to, we need to remember the way in which that God's ways are not our ways. And we need to look at this scene from Exodus 32 and it should scare us. Like, because we have this tendency in humans when we have to wait for God's timing, we want to fashion golden calves. And God is heartbroken in the story and he's angry. See, they sacrifice their true identity as God's people to become idol worshipers and the results are brutal. There's brutal ramifications when we sacrifice our identity as the people of God. The text says in verse 35 of chapter 32, they became a laughing stock and violence ensues. You can read it this week in Exodus 32, but just promise me if you read Exodus 32, read Exodus 33, because the whole story goes from misplaced expectations to violence to ultimately intimacy. 
but it's not an easy story. But see, the reality for us as modern day Christians, we can say, gosh, this makes a lot of sense. When God's timing, God's ways are mysterious, the community can often turn into each other. And for us in this day and age, it's time to remember our call as disciples. Disciples remember the Palm Sunday and the story of Israel. We need to be waiting. We need to be trusting. Like that's what disciples do. Like we need to remember we can be formed in the wilderness, but we need to embrace that nature that we understand. We have a lust for easy answers and to quick endings. And God's like, you're going to have to wait for my obedience. You're going to have to trust me. See, discipleship is that God desires you in relationship to grow into trusting him. And that's not a fast process. And we run the risk of making an idol uh, of a God in our image. And ultimately, we lose our unity when we stop declaring that God's will will be done in our lives. Uh, This weekend, my wife and the girls were gone for the weekend, so we had a guy's weekend. We watched, of course, Marvel movies, right? And so we watched Captain America Civil War. And the movie left me a bit unsettled. Because in the climax of Captain America's Civil War, the the evil one, the antagonist, is not a god from another world or somebody that has incredible power. It was a simple man with a goal to destroy the Avengers. His tactic was to get them to turn into attacking each other. At the end of the film, the evil antagonist Zemo says, an empire topped by its enemies can rise again, but that one which crumbles from within will be dead forever. So he spins up conflict to the point that the entire army of superheroes heroes go to war with each other. And I hated it. And it scared me because turning our heroes against each other is a little bit like what's going on in the church right now. So we have to remember in Christ, we have authority. Remember what Jesus said, Luke 10. He says that I have come that nothing would harm you. And in Christ, we have a power. Palm Sunday is a holiday of misplaced expectations on God. But God wants to not give us power in our image, but in his, a filling of the Holy Spirit. When we're fully submitted to his authority and his timing and his plans in our life, that's where power comes from. Not our expectations, but his. Romans 8, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our power. That's our declaration. That's our witness. But notice as people of God, when we're waiting and and we're not submitting to God, our unity can easily be displaced. So we remember about Palm Sunday. And then secondly, we've got to confess because God's followers have often gotten it wrong about the character of God. So we've got to practice confession. Both of these texts remind us that a Christian community is a confessing community, both confessing God as power and confessing our own brokenness. We must practice confession regularly. It's important to remember because if I can teach about Palm Sunday, when you think about Palm Sunday, remember uh, this is from Matthew 21, verse eight. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Like they wanted Jesus to finish the revolution. They wanted a kingdom on their own terms. And they were asking Jesus to do it. And ultimately, it would cost Jesus his life. He would give it up willingly in order to, to, to bring the real revolution. See, they gave up their identity just as Israel had done with the golden calf. But still Jesus came. Still he, he came knowing that they were worshiping him for the wrong reasons. In everything Christ did, he, he brought life and power, even in his death, even in his suffering for victory of his name's sake. Matthew 27, later in the story, verse 15 and 16, where where Pilate would bring Jesus out. The crowd cried, we want Jesus Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas. They wanted literally a different Jesus. And that's a real warning for us. Am I willing to accept Jesus the way that he is or do I expect him the way I want him to be? So we, church, have got to confess when we miss God's best, when we drift Like go back to Exodus 32, 
What happens in the story? Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives and sons and daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So the people took off their earrings. They brought them to Aaron. He handed them and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. And then he said, these are your gods, Israel. And then he built an altar. And he said, tomorrow we'll worship. Like worship gets distorted, not on who God is, but on our missed identity. See, historically, we live in an age of reckoning where places where we've missed God's best. And one time we used to call ourselves a Christian nation, but we look around now and we've drifted a long way. I mean, last week in the gunning down of Asian American women in Atlanta, a shooting in a prominent Seattle church. I mean, we just, we, we must confess, God, we've drifted from your best We have this racialized country and racial violence. It's over there. It's right here. It's among us. We have so much work to do to eliminate racism and violence in our world. And it won't start until we stop denying and we confess, God, we've drifted from your heart. God, we've got work to do. God, we have scars from our uh, historical racialized society but God, would you return us closer and closer and closer to your heart? As we were studying this week, Pastor Richard was reminding us, he just watched this documentary on the, on the life of Abraham Lincoln. And the thing with Lincoln, he was revolutionary, not for always getting it right, but being willing for his viewpoint to change. A summary statement from the film was, Lincoln had huge blind spots, but he was waiting for his worldview to change. This is why church confession is so important because we're coming back to Lord continually and saying, God, I've gotten it wrong, forgive me, help me get it right again. And that's why it's a practice that we must just continue to trust that our confession will lead us closer to the heart of God, closer to just like, God, what are the calves that I've made in my life of my timing, of my expectations? Like it's been a rough year, we get it. But church, may we believe our brokenness can be a doorway to transformation when we open our hands and say, God, we're gonna trust what you put into them, not what we try to cling on our own. Changing by the act of recalibrating to the will of God, that's what confession teaches us again and again, that Jesus is a God who measures faithfulness, not by success, but by our willingness to return to him. When we fail, we learn how to confess. And you see that all over the scriptures. I mean, consider Luke 22, Peter's denial. This is the scriptures, Luke 22. Peter, seizing him, they led him away. They took Jesus into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when there had been kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and people sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw Peter in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with Jesus, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know what you're talking about. And a little while later, someone else looked, hey, Peter, you are one of them. And Peter's like, no, I'm not. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him because he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And verse 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Verse 61 kills me every time I read it. The Lord looked at him. The Lord sees us when we fail and we don't have to hide and we don't have to run. God just saying, will you confess when you miss me? Will you believe that that your inability to live up to your end of the covenant doesn't disqualify you? Just return through confession, return through worship of the true God. See, Peter's failure becomes the doorway through which he's able to see the gospel with increased clarity. And so I just want to ask you with your family, with your house church, with friends, where have you failed? Where are you failing? That's a big question. But maybe just say like, maybe confession could be not just an entrance for shame, but a place to return to what God's best is for your life. I mean, just this year, another prominent Christian institution covering up allegations and true things that the founder had done in violation of his covenant with his wife. And they covered it up. And we do this as a church. We cover things up. God says, confess. And finally, the Lord is asking us to hunger. Hunger. Remember what the title of of our sermon was? That failure becomes a predictor of future blessing. 
Here's the promise of the gospels. You can be formed by failure. See, God doesn't desire your perfection. He desires your hunger for his glory. And our disappointment can become a doorway for those willing to see. Our inability to live up to the perfect Christian nature. No, no, that doesn't disqualify us from relationship with God. It Actually, if you're willing to hunger for him, it can draw you deeper and deeper into the heart of God. I mean, Exodus 32 is hard, but look what happens in 33. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you some rest. And, and Moses is hungry. He's like, God, I want to see you. And when we get hungry for more as God's people, when we say, God, show me your glory, that's when God says, okay, come on. Are you, yes, if you want to see me, I want you to see me. Moses says at the end of Exodus 33, he says, God, I want to see your glory in Exodus 33, verse 18. And I want to just say some words to remind you, church, that failure can lead to future glory if you're hungry for the Lord. Like look at verse 33, 19. The Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord in your presence. And he draws Moses up on the mountain. And then he said, there's a place near me where you can stand on a rock where my glory passes by. I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover with my hand and the Lord passes over Moses and he sees the glory of the Lord. Oh my goodness. When we're hungry for more of God, when we're able to remember and then confess, but when we end not in a place of shame or self-condemnation or certainly not judgment, when we say, God, I'm hungry for you, the world changes our heart changes, our families change, addictions start to change, chains start breaking because God is powerful. And so if you, church, are hungry for more of him in your life, I promise you, glory awaits because God longs to fill his people with hunger. We're gonna sing a song here in just a minute. I'm gonna invite the band back because we're gonna sing this song. And I'll just tell you a final story before we do. Just this week, we said goodbye to some really key people, Jen and Levi Pauly. They're house church leaders, and Jen's been on staff. And last uh, Wednesday, as we gathered as a staff to say goodbye and speak words of affirmation, it's something we do as a North staff for birthdays and special times. So everyone was going around speaking words of affirmation about Jen, about her characteristics and qualities. And there was tears, and there was laughter, and it was a really sweet time. And then she said some words to us. And she reminded me. She said, we came to Bethany, Scott, a couple of years ago. And you were telling a story. You were, you were telling a story about one of your coworkers who said from God these words. Hey, tell the church there at Bethany North. Ask me for more. Like we were dealing with something about a property that ended up not working out, but way bigger than that. This coworker of mine almost two years ago, she spoke these words, Scott, God wanted you to hear from his heart. Ask me for more, ask me for more. So just this week, as we're like saying goodbye to Jen, you know, she started reminding me of this hunger that we had heard God kind of speak over us. And I hadn't remembered that story for a bit, but as Jen started to speak, I got the spirit bumps, like the spirit of God was just falling on me, even on a Zoom call, even in my lonely little office with my coworkers. Because when the people of God are hungry to experience God for the glory of God, when the people of God say, God, we remember that we often have gotten it wrong, but still you came. And God, we want to confess places where we've settled for another God, for little calves, for for, for sin that we've allowed to just hang around us. Maybe we're we're just kind of given in to the spirit of despair, brokenness. Maybe maybe we're just given in to a a spirit of, of discouragement. God is asking us to return to him and to hunger for his glory in our lives. So church, as we enter into Holy Week, we remember Hosanna. Here comes the King. Here comes the Savior. They they had no idea how true they were even, with the words how true they were, they were even saying. But may we this week, church, may we hunger for more of God in our lives. May we say these words, Hosanna, 
want to encourage you to remember, to maybe confess as you prepare for our Good Friday service, Pastor Raul will be teaching, for our Easter morning services. And church, I want to take this journey of hunger with you, that we would collectively, even a year into a pandemic, hunger for more and more and more of God's glory. Because God never fails to, to show people his glory for those that are hungry for it. So as we sing these, this last song, as we sing these words, may you just close your eyes in prayer. Maybe, maybe some of you want to move into confession. Maybe some of you just want to move straight into worship. But may we collectively hunger to experience all that God has for us, both this morning and this week as we're preparing for Holy Week. We love you, church. We're in this together. Let's, let's sing these words and worship together. that song of just a declaration that just by just by falling to our knees just by expressing a hunger and a desire God that that's that's all you ask for that's all you ask for 
So God, awaken in us a hunger to experience your glory. Bring us closer and closer together as a people, God, who want to see you. As complicated as it is, we want to see you. We want to be a, a unified body of avengers in your name and your power. And God, we declare Hosanna because the King is coming. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, it's so good to be with you. You heard earlier, come, families, come and see us for the Palm Sunday drive through and then online Good Friday or Easter, or if you're interested in joining us in person Easter, that closes today. Thank you for the journey of the last year. You're a church that does hunger to experience God. We miss you. We love you. We're in this together. We'll see you soon. <laughs>